Hi everybody, welcome back. Hopefully everybody is well fed and well rested and ready for the second half of the day. Um, I'm Steph Santoso. I'm with uh, the Infosys Foundation USA team um, and I'm uh, happy to welcome you to our session today on future steps in CS education. And so this session is specifically looking at the progress that has been made to date on uh, CS for all and really thinking about broadening access to high quality computer science education for our students, but also thinking about what's next and what um, current and existing challenges we still need to tackle. So um, I would love to just first introduce the panelists. Uh, so moderating today's panel is Kumar Garg. Uh, Kumar and I actually worked together uh, during the Obama administration in the Office of Science and uh, Tech Policy. Um, and he's currently a senior fellow at the Society for Science and the Public. Um, he's joining as a lead policymaker and strategist um, around the society's mission of cultivating scientific understanding among children and adults. And then um, while he was at OSTP, uh, led a, a whole number of initiatives really focused on helping to shape science and tech policy for the administration. Um, and then we also have joining with us today uh, as panelists, we have Cameron Wilson. Cameron's the president of code.org, and actually he's the COO. That's right, right? You're not the president, you're the COO. Also very important. <laughs> um, so Cameron, as the COO, oversees the advocacy outreach and operations team for code.org and helps guide the organization's efforts to expand access to K through 12 education. We also have with us today David Reed from Creighton University, and David is an associate professor and director of CS and informatics. Um, and his primary interests are in programming languages and CS education. Um, and he's worked on topics such as apprentice-based learning, web-based programming, and innovative instructional methods around CS. Um, and then we also have Jan Cooney of the National Science Foundation. Uh, Jan is a computer scientist, um, and she's been leading efforts really to broaden participation in K through 12 education and competing for a whole host of years. Um, and uh, Jan has worked at NSF as a program director since uh, 2004. Um, and then we have Leanne, um, who is uh, Leanne uh, Delizer, who is with CSNYC. And so she's been a lifelong advocate for CS education and um, has really been working to add CS to high school uh, classrooms. And you're also the chair of the CS for All Consortium, is that correct? Um, uh, so I'll go ahead and hand it off to Kumar to kick us off. Well, uh, it's great to have everybody here. And it's, it's really an excellent panel. Um, I just wanted to give like a little bit of context and just thanks to Infosys, you know, Vandana and Costa and Steph and the whole team for really bringing everybody together. Uh, you know, part of I think the hope for the day is that there's a huge amount of expertise and wisdom that is built up in this community, but the Computer Science for All movement is a rapidly growing movement. There's new companies, new foundations, new school districts and others who are rapidly entering the space. So how do we like level set? watching it over the eight years, the Obama years, you know, I used to call, I remember Jan telling me about the like the decimation of computer science at the K-12 level uh, in 2009, and the, and the work that started early on has led to now the historic increase in CSAT and the number of students that are taking it. I remember Cameron uh, talking about this thing called CS Ed Week. Uh, and, uh, like, <coughs> I just think that there's a huge amount, and you know, the work that's now starting with the CSL so there's just a ton of um, uh, wisdom on the stage. You know, one thing I like to do, and given that they gave me moderator privileges, uh, <laughs> is uh, I really like to run these conversations informed by what you all want to get out of them. There's a lot of knowledge. So what I like to do at the beginning of a panel is actually collect questions. I have lots of questions for this panel, but I want to make it integrated as to what people want to hear. So uh, if folks could raise their hands, 
question is, we'll get, we'll collect them all, and then we'll start the panel. So who wants to play? Can you question? Um, hold your, the mic up? Yes. Your, yeah, there you Sorry. go. Yes, sir. Total Life, Future America. I want to know what's the depth of, oh, yeah. Right. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the Colin White, Teach for America. I would love to know what role all of you think administrators and just our, our broader administrator community in our schools will play moving forward over the next 10 to 20 years in making computer science for all a reality. That's great. Yeah. I'm on the other Michigan State. I'd like to know where do you see CS education in five years from now? I'm BT from San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, how do we move from re going from access to like high quality computer science education and supporting that and assessing that? Great, access versus quality, yeah. Uh, hi, Dan Garcia, UC Berkeley, also video of Direct Computing. Uh, my question is, what are the wins in our face? What are the folks, who are the folks we have to, I, I get it that money isn't there and I get it that teachers aren't there, all those things are there, but if they all came, who doesn't want to see us succeed? Who are the folks that we are displacing? Who are the, like if it's, you know, CS wins, someone has to lose in a zero sum model, who are the folks not wanting to be in the CS for all conversation? Okay, great, yes sir. Yeah, I'm coming. Sorry, we're making staff work for us. Meryl Tsami, Stanford. I was wondering your thoughts on the change in administration, how that's going to affect the CS education agenda going forward. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a great <laughs> Randy Lynn, Code, uh, Kids Code Mississippi. I'm curious about um, expanding opportunities for computer science education in states that don't traditionally have a, a large uh, tech sector. A bunch of the different themes at different levels of both government and other players. Yeah. Can't not ask a question with this panel. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Delora, a former co worker of Kumar and Stephanie. And uh, the question that I have is so, five years from now, when we've solved all of the equity challenges in computer science education, <laughs> there's people laughing. That makes me sad. How do, how do we bridge the gap? How do we get computer science education into lower income schools and for uh, underrepresented youth? Anybody else? Awesome. All right, so that's, that's, that's a good sort of start. You know, why don't we, um, sorry, I should do the mic. Um, so one question that seems to come up is what, what, is, the, what is the future that we are trying to go towards? And one way we could start that is by trying to think about where we've come. So if we were assembling this group uh, five years ago and saying, okay, like, you know, we were somewhere in the midst of the update on the AP, you know, early days of code.org, you know, what, what would be the questions that the field was struggling with then that feel like we've made substantial progress since now versus the kind of key questions that you all think are animating the space today. And then I want to take you through, where do you think, if folks work really hard, we'll be in this kind of five years from now question? So who wants to take you know, what questions from five years ago? So five years ago, I was in a very different role than I am right now. Um, and I, had, I was all but dissertation from Carnegie Mellon in computer science and had moved back to New York and got pulled into a project to start a new high school in New York City with a venture capitalist named Fred Wilson. And the conversation in the room was, you know, there are so many tech companies in New York City who are failing because they don't have enough talent to hire out of the city population. The, the kids go and they go to MIT and they go to CMU, but they don't come back to New York City, they go somewhere else. They just weren't producing enough homegrown talent to fill what they need. So we needed a new high school. We need more computer science in the public schools. And 
the advisory board was about half software engineers and folks like Joel on software and Fred's like super high powered team, people from Google and Facebook at the table, and the other half was New York City Department of Education. And half the room said, oh, we need a new Stuyvesant High School focused on coding, right? And the other half of the room said, we already get enough flack for having specialized high schools that are not matching the diversity of our city. We're not going to do that again. And the room very quickly arrived at the question, can you teach average <coughs> New York City public school kids computer science? Will they learn? Can they even learn it? Because if they're not going to Stuyvesant, then clearly they may not be able to understand computer science. It's a rocket science subject. That was literally three months of conversation in 2011. And I love that today we're at a point not can kids learn to code, not should kids learn to code, but every kid must learn to code as a part of illiteracy. And so I think that's a huge shift from people who are not in this work the way that we are from everyday folks in policy, in schools, on the ground, parents, everyone. So I'll, I'll answer that one as well, and I kind of, I definitely agree with Leanne. Uh, around five years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, I was on a talk show, a talk radio show in DC, um, the Kojo Namdi show, which is a very famous show in DC. And it was, I was with uh, Maggie Johnson from Google, and we were talking about sex <coughs> education. Every call, was hostile. It was the most unpleasant hour I had ever spent. People called in, computer science was too hard, my kids can't learn this, even if they could learn it, it just changes all the time, so there's no reason to teach it to them. You people live in an ivory tower, we don't need any more computer scientists. Every single question was totally hostile, and I swore I would never, ever go on a talk radio show again. <laughs> but uh, a little more than a year ago, I did go back to the Kojo Namdi show with someone from Code.org and, and someone from the University of Maryland. And the, every single call, except for one totally crazy person, but every coherent call came from somebody who really thought this was great. Why aren't my kids doing this? How do I get this in my school? How do I become a teacher of this? Um, how do we get this to happen everywhere? The whole conversation had completely changed over that time period. So I think we've made I, I think that Karen and I started a long time ago working on this, and, and most of what we were doing was convincing people that they needed to do this. But now I think that that's pretty much, that phase is over, and we're now trying to help people figure out how to do it uh, in, a, in an effective way. Yeah. Um, first I wanted to say, uh, I don't know if you realize how intimidating that was to hear those questions. and sit up here and know that that's what you're expecting us to answer <laughs> at the end of this hour. Um, that is, it's a horrible thing to do a panel, to, to, to do that up front. Um, yeah, we, we were talking out there. I think that the conversation has really changed, and I think it's, it's, it's uh, I'll reiterate what, what you guys said, but, but maybe a little bit more simplistically. Uh, I think back five years ago, we were still trying to convince people that computer science was something that, that was of value, that, that everyone needed to know or to have access to. Um, I think we're past that. I think also we were not very good, and I'm not claiming we are now, but we're better, uh, at explaining what computer science was. Um, and I think that was, a, was a, a great hindrance to what we have. And I think now with, with the framework and the, the standards that are coming out, um, it's not so much about what is it that, that we're talking about that we want students to be able to do, but we're ready now to be talking about, okay, how do we do this? How do we make this work? How do we find the teachers? Uh, how do we train them? How do we convince the schools to, to offer these courses? Um, and so I think it, it's really gone from a why and a what to a how question. Uh, so I'll reflect it sort of a high level and then <clears throat> like Hal Speed calls this sort of the middle level of work in the, in the CS education space. It was probably a little bit more than five years ago. I went into Fairfax County, which is where I live. It's a major school district. And, um, um, in Virginia, and I was talking to, I think, deputy, 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 somebody down in, for curriculum instruction and saying, hey, I'd really like computer science in my home district. Um, and she, I, I'll never forget that she looked at me and said, that sounds great, what's the PD? Uh, not sure. Because <laughs> uh, I, I think at that point, you know, 
NSF's investments in the initial CSP models were um, just in the pilot stage, and we hadn't really had a whole lot of models out there for, and you know, now we have Bootstrap and Guts and CSP and Code.org, and you know, it's, there are multiple things now that <laughs> districts can actually start to think about what does implementation look like, Tinker, Scratch, I mean, there's a, just, the space is now um, infused with people that can provide that level of PD, and we can start to answer that question. Like, what does that actual PD look like? So, uh, that, you know, that was, and to do it at scale, right? I mean, that's the other piece of this. So, uh, that certainly was something I, that's changed over time. And then, I said this on the morning panel, um, certainly five years ago, no states were thinking or talking about computer science education. Uh, well, I don't know that for a fact, but for the most part, I wasn't hearing about it, and we had 23 states come together in December to all start to figure out what do we want to do about computer science education. And then in the spring, uh, there was another convening where probably a dozen states came together to start to do deeper work around um, what does policy implementation look like. And that's, that's a sea change. Um, now we have you know, a state level of attention uh, on computer science that we've never had before. Great. So just to now start to unpack some of the questions that came in and you know, the how question. So one piece of the how question that obviously comes up, you know, most people when you sort of ask them, they say, well, the big rate limiting factor is teachers. You know, hey, we want to, we would love to offer more of these in our school, but we need teachers who are ready to do it, who are trained to do it. You know, what, I would love sort of, you know, you guys have been working on this for a while, sort of unpack that question as it sits right now, which is, is it that, you know, so a lot of students took the AP course, like where exact, you know, which are the places where you think, like we basically have it figured out, we have some of the PD models, districts are figuring it out, versus where there's like not much going on, you know, basically earlier grades. And what are the like, what are the naughtiest problems right now on getting a lot more teachers ready and teaching this in the next 18 months in a <coughs> what do people sort of think is the PD challenge right now, given that there has been a lot of work on developing the model, there are some, there are a bunch of organizations who are focusing on scale up, you know, so like wh what are the things that really folks are sort of struggling with, or is it like now lots of people are saying yes, and we're just having like a connect the dots, you know, they just need to figure out, they just need to get one of you all on the phone, and we're basically 80% of the way there. Who wants to sort of unpack the like the teacher's question as it sits right now for you? I'll start. Uh, I think we're seeing a term, well, in terms of how we address the teacher pipeline, I, and I'll tee this up for Leanne, hope she can talk about this a little bit. The pre-service is where the community, I'm sorry, in-service is where the community is largely focused, right? Which is, we've all made a bet around, we can prepare in-service teachers to teach computer science courses, and you know, hopefully they'll give us one or two sections and we'll reach 60 students or so uh, in, a, in a school, right? So that's one way um, to do that. Alternative certification is another way of sort of getting the teacher problem solved. And the third way is pre-service. So I'm like, if I'm thinking five years out from now, the pre-service question I think will be a lot more clear and that'll be a major issue we need to start to address, particularly given how slowly that part of the system moves or needs to move to really transform things. So I think that's part of it. Um, I, I, I think generally there's just a continuing marketing, you know, reaching new teachers, reaching out in communities uh, to get for com computer science principals. Uh, a lot of us were on a call last week that are providers in this space. And we all know it's hard to recruit high school teachers to teach computer science because somebody asked over there, what's the role of administrators? Well, none of us wants to PD up a teacher, put them through professional learning if they're not gonna actually teach the course, which means you have to get on a master schedule slot, which means an administrator has to say, yes, I wanna teach this course. So we have to get to the administrator level to make sure that that gets on the schedule. And then you have to have counselors and administrators as part of that system so that they're recruiting a diverse set of students. And you know that's the, Kind of, so I, I don't think I can unpack just the teacher part without like looking at this broader ecosystem and 
those are the things that are challenges for us, uh, certainly, um, that could already on the scale we look at. Uh, sure, are the, I think Dave probably could speak a bunch about what CSTA is doing for teachers. I'll round out the, the end of it if we come across. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll double down on that sort of there's not an easy answer because I think there are a lot of different sectors that are, have very different needs. And so if we're looking at, even you divide things out at level, K-8 versus nine through 12, um, you're looking at very different needs and very different backgrounds. At K-8, you're, you're most likely looking at uh, teachers that are already in place, the in-service, and how do we provide them enough training and enough support and networking. I know. Uh, Mark Nelson loves to use the, the phrase, uh, we want them to be competent and confident, and that's a, a really important um, thing. And so uh, providing the resources for them to, to, to be able to teach at, at that level. Uh, if you look at 9 to 12, then you're, you're doing both sort of the in-service that uh, we're going to take some math and science teachers and train them, but that, that's a limited well. That's not something that we're going to keep tapping into, and I think we're already feeling some pushback uh, from those, those areas that, that uh, are seeing that, that it is becoming a little bit zero sum and that if they're, uh, we're now counting CS, that means there's less science courses or less, fewer teachers that can, that can teach that. Um, the one thing I think that we're really excited about in, with CSTA right now is, is sort of the direction of, of badges and micro-credentials. And I think this is, a, is a, a way to really address a lot of these different types of needs um, both from being able to help uh, in-service teachers to identify you know, what is it that they, they don't know, what are the things that, that they would like to know, and, and sort of plan out, this is the type of professional development I'd like to get, um, to be able to connect them with, with different professional development agencies, um, and then be able to uh, document what they've done and what they've accomplished. And I think that could, I know at the, um, uh, the, the pre-service panel this morning, there was discussion that even uh, those could end up being a, a, a mechanism for uh, secondary um, uh, certificates. So that if you're uh, getting a math education degree, maybe a, a combination of these badges would also then uh, allow you to, to count the computer science secondary certificate. Um, and I think there's potential there for that being portable as well, that if that could be something that could go across states, so that if there are the central agencies and uh, we hope to be one of those with CSTA of being able to say, here are these uh, accomplishments that they've done that a teacher could go and say, you know, we don't have computer science certification in our state, but I'm, uh, I have badges in these different areas and that qualifies me to be able to teach in that. Uh, so I think that's one area where you can address a lot of the different needs of the, of the different constituencies uh, and maybe help to, to alleviate that, that need for more teachers. So I would say one of the, I agree with all the things that have been said, I think one of the big concerns for me and the <coughs> teachers at the moment is, uh, are we really being successful in addressing equity? So I think that teachers, when they start out, especially if they're coming from another discipline, are particularly concerned about content knowledge. And we also want them to do project-based learning and inquiry-based learning, and we want them to teach collaborative learning, and we want them to do a whole bunch of stuff. And it's a really a lot. And so I think that in the beginning, their questions and their focus is more on content. And then as they go on, they pick up these other things. But we, uh, we need to really make sure that teachers get access to ongoing professional development, that it's not just, a, oh, we trained you last summer and you're set to go, but that they really get uh, ongoing help. I think that we're developing many more resources across the country, so making sure that teachers have access to these and know about them. Um, I think that the equity problem has to do with uh, with training teachers and getting them prepared to teach in a really way that's equitable to make computer science relevant to a wide range of students' lives. I think that's really important. But I also think it's really important that we get into those schools that are low resource schools. I don't have the data yet for where <coughs> we were with the uh, College Board course, but I suspect that we're still missing a lot of low resource schools and that those schools are going to be the ones who struggle the most to get an in-service teacher free to teach this course, even if they were trained. And those teachers, once they become trained, are now really uh, hot items on the, on the market. And they end up moving, in some cases, to schools that are higher resource and have higher salaries and have less problems. And so for the same reasons that teachers normally leave uh, low resource schools, I think that's going to be even worse in the computer. 
computer science area. So I think that keeping the communities focused, a lot of the community when they started getting involved in this cared about equity and making sure that all kids had access to this. And I think that that continues to be a big problem uh, with respect to getting great teachers into those low resource schools. Great. So I'm really glad I get to go last because I get to take a completely different perspective from all of you. Um, the work that we're doing nationally at the CS for All Consortium is really just an extension of the work that CSMIC has been doing in New York City for the last five years. And so if I put on my New York City hat for a second, New York City is nothing if not an exercise in scale. 1,700 schools, 90,000 teachers, 1.1 million kids. Uh, and our mayor mandate says every school will teach computer science to every child at least once in the grade band that they cover. So a high school cannot just offer an elective course for 30 kids and check the box for the mayor's mandate. They have to say, okay, 10th grade is the CS for all grade. Every 10th grader gets computer science somehow. Now that changes and it flips the script a little bit. We've been doing CS Ed and I've been in CS Ed since 2000 along with many people on this stage. And we think about that at the high school level. So we think in terms of courses, right? Computer science standalone courses. And yet the majority of the uptick we're seeing in New York City, and I think a lot of what we're seeing with the framework across the country is actually finding integrated computer science, right? There, I heard somebody say a few weeks ago that Scratch is the new diorama project. <laughs> yeah, let's let, let sink in for a second. Scratch is the new diorama. What a better way to project your learning in the modern world than in a modern media for the classics that you're studying in your regular classes. Um, and so we have to think about the teacher pipeline. We love to use the word pipeline. And yet so much of what's occurring right now is opening the door, shoving people into the pipe, waving at them as we close the door behind them. I think CSTA's badging stuff is the first initiative to take teachers past that classroom door in their professional development, right? The work that CSNYC is doing with Amon and others in a Home for CS project, finding a home for computer science in schools of education. How do we take every single elementary school teacher and have them come out of college where the learning is paid for by their tuition dollars not by private funding, not by the National Science Foundation, right? But instead, the standard way that a math teacher gets their math content, right? How do we get that to happen? We get that to happen by engaging schools of education, right? How do we then take a teacher who's been in the classroom for five years and help them make the transition to a leader? Turn them into a content coach. I want principals and assistant superintendents and superintendents who say, oh yeah, I was a computer science teacher, right? I wanna foster that long tail of growth, not just to the classroom door, but through the classroom doors to positions of leaderships in our administration, where their knowledge about being a computer science teacher informs just as much as my principal when I was teaching who was a physics teacher, and my superintendent who was an English teacher, and the chancellor of New York City Public Schools who was an elementary school teacher. And they bring that experience to their policy making every day. And so we need computer science teachers who are in that pipeline as well. Great. So, the you know Jan covered this a little bit with this big question about equity, and just to sort of stay on that for a second, you know, when you know equity happens on many different lenses. There's how do we get more girls participating and succeeding in these subjects, given the the rate of uh, number of uh, women that are graduating with CS degrees at the collegiate level, right? So that's like, we're still at the 20% rating, so there's a huge gap there. There is, you know, underrepresented minorities. There is low income, there's rural. And, you know, in each of those, you know, usually there's like folks who are doing really good work about what are ways that bias might be playing a role, or teacher education might be playing an important role, or uh, active, you know, removing sort of the sense of it's not for me, for the students. Is there, you know, what's, you know, I'm, I'm always curious, you know, sometimes I feel like the, depending on where you start in the conversation, you might know a lot. As, the, as organizations that are thinking about this at a national level, 
what are ways that you're sort of thinking about embedding a lot of what the community is learning around how to build equity deep into the design of these programs? Um, and how are you sort of implementing that so that when somebody says, hey, how do I bring this into my district? Or how do I bring this into my school? You know, it's kind of, it's built in that some of the key program elements, they're gonna make sure that, you know, everyone's, I mean, obviously some of this was in the AP course, but I'm just sort of curious as the movement grows, what are ways to sort of keep the lens on equity and how are you all sort of struggling or thinking through that question? And whoever wants to take it. Well, I'll, I'll just mention, that, I mean, I find the release of, of CS principles just incredibly exciting. And I think part of the reason is that this is a course that was designed with equity and inclusivity as part of its design. And I think that we've had decades of experience of trying to take our existing curricula, our existing teaching methods, and say, how do we make this more attractive to minor, to underrepresented groups, to women, uh, with, with fairly limited success on that. And I think that uh, sort of the approach of, okay, how do we actually start uh, and design a course that's gonna be interesting and relevant to everyone? Um, I, I do think though that I, the, the, I worry about the pendulum a little bit um, and that I hear from some people thinking, okay, well, CS Principles is out there, so we're done now. Uh, we've addressed equity, it's gonna be solved at this point. Um, I don't think that that is realistically gonna happen. I think it's gonna make a difference. I think there's probably gonna be tweaking that happen to, happens with that, but I. I hope that, that what we can learn from that is, is how when you start from the beginning making equity a, a valued part of your design, that, that that's going to be the way that you really start making a difference on things. Sure. So I think that, that the, one of the things uh, in CS for All, right, is we talk about the all being the diversity. And we talk about computer science being the content. I really find it interesting that nobody talks about the four. What does it mean to be for all, right? Does for all mean that there's one course that is offered at the school that somebody could take, right? So in terms of thinking about computer science as a literacy that we embed in all disciplines, that it becomes the, the way that students express themselves uh, throughout media, throughout their academic career, you know, code.org in the elementary school programs, they don't say, oh, well, you should have the third graders raise their hand if they want to do computing and then go over in another room, right? All kids should do this in their classrooms. And so when you get to the point where you're thinking about not equity within the room, you have to start thinking about equity in the systems where you're reaching. So in the United States, there are 50 million kids who go to public school. Uh, in that 50 million kids, 30 million of them go to a school district with fewer than 20 schools. Right? We are not reaching those small schools in our CS for All movement. We're reaching the larger school districts that have the funding to be able to put a curriculum person at the district level, who have the funding to gather a cluster of teachers to offer a PD to a whole collection of them, as opposed to one school that's out in the middle. You know, Rebecca Doby and Code VA does a lot of work with rural education. There are six, about 16,000 school districts and school associations in the United States, and 15,000 of them fit this profile of fewer than 20 schools. And so how do, we pro how do we make sure that our equity is not only about who's in the room? Because if we're serving everyone in the room, then we don't have to, I mean, we do have to do the sticky work of making sure our rooms and our content is accessible and equitable. But also we have to think about how are we reaching the systems of equity as well. I'll just reflect a little bit on some feedback I get from our professional learning and curriculum team uh, in terms of the equity of the practice and teaching practice. I, you know, one of the things that's unknown about a lot of the movement that's happening, uh, Jan sort of laid out a vision for, you know, CSP is we're not only putting in computer science into the curriculum often for the first time. We're also trying to transform teaching practice at the same time. Um, and it turns out doing both at the same time is pretty hard. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time, I don't do this, but the, our team spends a lot of time on intentional professional learning design that is built and embedded with equity. Uh, and that's a big part of like what the Summer Institutes look like. 
do a five-day workshop and then the follow-up workshops that happen to help support that and drive home messages. And it's very intentional about actually putting that in, the, in, in place. And it's not, you know, hey, I'm going to learn about for loops. It's, you know, hey, I'm going to learn about teaching and practice. And, and that's, a, I mean, we're not the only ones that done Everybody in the community's done that. We've modeled it after a lot of what, you know, exploring computer science and a lot of the other groups that have put together um, how to teach equitably for a number of years. So, but it's hard. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, so, you know, that's the way I think about it. But one of the things I definitely don't think we've addressed, like, so in our model, we have teachers come in for the summer and then we have follow-up workshops, which is similar to a lot of different models. Doesn't, we've heard consistently over and over again, this just doesn't work for rural. And that's a big issue. And so what we've tried to do around that is build local capacity as much as we can um, so that the local community has facilitators that they can pull in to try to reach the rural side, but I, I think generally that's a, an open question about that part of the equity issue. So, you know, part of, um, part of I think the challenge also is that uh, when I sort of talk to folks who are entering into this space, they're like, you know, who can I go to and who's offering what types of help? And one thing that you all sort of provide is that each of your organizations you know, Jan is a funder, you know, have particular ways people who have been in the space have learned to work with you really well. Like, we do these things really well, and here are four ways to plug into our work. So I'm sure some of this will be obvious to people, but I always like doing this as an exercise because often when you actually ask somebody, what are four ways people could be working with you, somebody will learn something in this group. So I would love to just go through and say, you know, here are ways, if you're a teacher or you're a school administrator, whatever, that you could be working with us, and here's what that looks like. Like here, here's like ways you could be putting together an NSF grant uh, that eventually ends up on Jan's desk. So if we could just do that, I just as a, you know, you all have, are doing work, and people in this room should know how to be able to work with you all. So who wants to go first? Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so NSF funds uh, mostly research. Uh, most of what we fund is research in science, so research in computer science or physics or math, um, subjects like that. But we do have a whole directorate that focuses on education. I'm in the computer science directorate, and my job is computer science education. And so we do fund computer science education. We work with the um, with the education directorate as part of the CS for All movement, NSF committed to spending $120 million over the next couple years. We spent $20 million of it last year, we're spending another $20 million right now, and then we have 80 left. So uh, we've put money in for the last um, nine years, so we've done quite a bit of, of funding. Um, I think that we've tried many different models because I think one of the things that we want to do at NSF is not just go into a school system and give them money to train their teachers and fix their problem, but we want to do that while we're learning something so that the next school system could use that. And so we're really focused on projects that do implementation or practitioners have kids learning things. Um, we funded the development of ECS, we funded the development of the new AP course, we funded a lot of professional development Beauty and Joy of Computing was one of them. Um, Ralph is back there with Mobile CSP. There's quite a few of these courses that we funded. We funded things on how to make teachers better. Um, Aman and um, Colleen <coughs> work in, in that area. So there's lots of different things that we fund. The way to get involved in that is to be involved in one of these projects. And I have come over the last couple of years to realize that um, we should be funding things that are in the form of a research practitioner partnership. So we started that this year, um, where researchers and practitioners work side by side. So yes, you want to implement CS in a school district, but you should be having a bunch of researchers who are studying what's happening at the same time. And they shouldn't be two distinct projects where they meet each other and they write the proposal and then they file reports together at the end. They should be working hand in hand. So the questions that the researchers are answering should be driven by the questions that the practitioners want to know. So the parts of their project that they most want data about, that they most want information about, that they don't quite understand or aren't quite working well, that's what the researchers should be looking at. 
So we are always uh, looking for projects like that. They are usually focused around some school districts and some local researchers. So if you're in a school district that might be willing to uh, be involved in a project like this, you need to hook up with a researcher. If you're a researcher who wants to do it, you need to hook up with some schools to, to get it to happen. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about how uh, you might make that happen or how you might participate in ongoing projects. The, um, Lynn Diaz, who's there, was the, the um, <coughs> organizer of the effort to create the College Board course from the College Board's part uh, college board side, and she worked with many teachers across the whole country. Hundreds of people piloted these courses, and students took the practice exams and all the stuff building up to it. So there's lots of room for getting involved, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to any of you after about how to do and, that. And do you have a live solicitation right now? Uh, excuse me? Do you have a live solicitation out right now? We have a solicitation that just closed, and we expect that a very similar solicitation will be available next year, if not exactly the same. Great. Who wants to go next? It, oh, by the way, it's called CS for All, so it should be easy to find. Sure. Uh, I can go next. Four? That's to be four. You can do live. Or can I give a political answer and answer the question I want to answer? Not, not yours, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll try to do four. Right? So if you're a teacher, um, we're happy to have you in professional learning if you want to teach computer science. Uh, we have a couple local partners there, Karen in the back, you can see, and uh, Tammy is probably hiding, but uh, there's a Utah and Indiana partners. Uh, we have 41 partners from across the country that can help prepare teachers locally. We're happy to have you. So that's sort of one. If you're a state, uh, we're happy to partner with you and plug in on advocacy policy reform, like what does computer science state planning look like? How do you utilize the K-12 CS framework? You know, people like Brian and Dwork and Ruthann here, that we're both writers and leaders on the K-12 framework and they can help states and guide states on, you know, hey, what do standards look like? Because that's one of the things we're advocating with just a handful of states having full K-12 standards right now. We need to make a national push on that. Um, if you're a parent, uh, we have a bunch of just advocacy tools. You can go to code.org promote, and you can download, hey, a letter to my local school board just to get computer science into place. Um, and then I'm struggling for a fourth. I don't know. If you're, if you're a student, you can go into Code Studio and uh, start, start K-5 curriculum today and start learning on your own, although we would encourage you to advocate as a student to bring that into the classroom so this isn't just you doing that alone, but all your students, to Leanne's point about embedding this in the formal space gets done. Uh, let me just add, Cameron went through these nice numbered things. I didn't number mine, so I missed one. But um, one of the things is that all of the projects that we fund, or many of the projects that we fund around professional development are offering professional development every summer. And it's possible for teachers, individual teachers, uh, from a school that wants to offer computer science to sign up for this. Um, so BJC has some professional development this summer. Um, Mobile CSP has some this summer. Uh, ECS has some this summer. Um, UTHCS has all of it. There are many, many different um, organizations that are offering PD this summer. And apropos of being here um, as the host with uh, Infosys, is that there is an option on Donors Choose. If you're a teacher and would like to go to one of these, you can get tuition and a stipend by putting up a project on Donors Choose. Donors Choose is a big crowdfunding site for education. And uh, for right now, Infosys is matching all of those donations. So if you go to Donors Choose and um, look at the um, CS for All section, it's got a, actually a complicated URL that I can give anybody who needs it. But uh, if you go to that and find that, you can sign up or sign up your local school. Uh, and you can also make donations or convince your buddies computer scientists who have everything, maybe they want to donate to their local school. The idea is to get, um, not to have teachers go out peddling their, their professional development, but to get the kind of company that spends $500 on a little league team, to donate $500 to training a teacher in computer science for their local school. So there's lots of ways that teachers can get involved. That was my number four, but I missed it. All right, so my first question, how many people here are members of the consortium? So I think I, I kind of got people engaged in a meaningful way. Um, but 
for those who didn't raise their hand or for those who are members and haven't quite engaged with us uh, really richly, I'd love to tell a couple of stories about uh, how you can engage. So I see Brett sitting there, Tonka. One of the things we do for our members is we run office hours. And so as a member of the consortium, you can sign up and get an hour with someone uh, from us who will talk to you about where you are and, and what you're trying to implement and how we can leverage the 370 members of the consortium to help you attain the goals that you have, right? So that's one thing. Uh, Aman is another great example. So Aman is a researcher. He's a co-PI with me on a grant with the National Science Foundation looking at uh, schools of education in computer science, right? And so the consortium, we really believe strongly that not only in research practitioner partnerships, but researcher, practitioner, content provider, funder partnerships. Those are our four real categories of work. So how do we give an opportunity for the schools to have their voices heard? How many people here participated in a focus group with the consortium last fall about what needs you have? So we did a needs assessment early on and we're sharing those data and then turning that back into programmatic offerings within the space. So uh, csforall.org, you can sign up to be a member. We actually have uh, one of our most popular things is the community calls we do. So we're shifting from one a month to two a month. Our next one is next week. We'll be featuring the work that CS for Rhode Island has done. And in this connected community model, the people from the state will be talking for a little bit on the call. And then we'll actually have two school districts joining the call and talking about how the work with the state has, has affected what's going on on the ground in the school. And if you can't make the time, we record them all, put them all up, and we featured states like Arkansas. <coughs> we just uh, had NC Witt as a feature for the community call. So participate in the community, ask your questions, learn, and then help us decide what to do through these needs assessment uh, and feedback mechanisms we have. Um, does everyone know CSTA and what, what we do? Um, so CSTA is a, a member organization, uh, more than 25,000 members worldwide. Um, that, that is about engaging, empowering, and advocating for computer science teachers at the K-12 level. Um, it's a very diverse group. Um, I think one of the discussions on the panel I was at earlier, uh, the distinction between a CS teacher and a teacher of CS. Um, those are, can be kind of different things. Um, but at the K-12 level, you're very often talking about a teacher who doesn't identify as a computer science teacher, but that teaches computer science or integrates computer science content. Um, those are part of, of what CSTA is as well. Um, we have about 40% of our membership that's international um, that have sort of different needs and, and such. Um, so, so we are really about sort of representing and providing for computer science teachers in a lot of different settings. And that, that, that's sort of both an inward and an outward uh, type of service. And there, there are a lot of resources that we develop. Um, again, the professional development, the, the, the professional development pipeline that's coming. Our annual conference is a, is a very big uh, event. If you're uh, going to be in Baltimore in July, please come. Um, and and yet we also do sort of an outward direction, um, different things, the CSTA standards, um, that are, the final ones are going to be released um, this summer. A number of our people that worked on the standards also worked on the framework. Um, that those are, are nice coordinated uh, documents and, and plans on things. Um, so there really is sort of a, a lot, we, we're, we're doing too much, we're trying to do too many things. Um, but uh, in terms of what, what we are looking for, we're looking for sort of uh, partnership support both small and large. Um, so we would love for you, if you're interested in computer science, K-12 computer science, which I presume you're here, you are interested. Uh, if you're not a member of CSTA, please join. Uh, we are actually moving to a dues model starting next year, so we would love to get your dues uh, to do that. Um, uh, we are also then looking to partner with, with uh, organizations, with companies that are, are wanting to support teachers. And again, we're really about the teacher side of things. And, and so uh, Infosys Foundation USA has been a great supporter of uh, professional development pipeline. ACM is a, is a wonderful supporter of us. Um, but even in terms of small things, well, some small, um, I'll give one antidote for the, the CSTA conference. Um, it, we, we keep the cost fairly low so that teachers can attend that, but it, but it is uh, still costly for a lot of teachers who don't have support. Um, Oracle uh, Academy has provided for the last couple of years scholarships for teachers, first time teachers to come to the conference. 
Um, this year they offered 35 scholarships. We had more than 600 applicants for those scholarships. Um, there is a huge demand for teachers to get access to this professional development to make, not only the professional development, but to make the networking connection, which is a, a big thing that we see as our role, of connecting teachers that are very often the only computer science teacher at their school. Um, a number of other organizations have stepped up and also provided scholarships uh, for the conference. Uh, companies like Rolls-Royce is, is now becoming a supporter and is, is providing some scholarships for teachers to attend. Um, so we're really always looking for partners that, that see that value, that, that recognize that, that it's great to help students. When you help a teacher, you help a lot of students. Uh, and you know, a single teacher can, can impact thousands of students over their, their career. Um, so we're sort of on that sort of teacher side of things and, and would love people to work with us to help teachers do their job to, to impact the students. I don't know if that was four. I don't know what it was. <laughs> so um, we're, we're approaching near the end, but I still want to do one quick final flash of sort of thoughts and questions from the audience, and then we'll use that to sort of close us, close us out with final comments. Any burning questions that sort of popped up from the panel? Name, uh, affiliation, questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Diane Levitt, I'm at Cornell Tech. And my question is, what do we do in five years when everything we've done is worked and we have a completely different prepared set of students, but the same prepared set of teachers? Sorry, you repeat that. Again, sorry. okay, sorry. <laughs> what do we do in five years when everything we've done has worked and our students uh, in kindergarten through eighth grade or in high school are now have a CS foundation. Our teachers are prepared the way we have already prepared them, but our students, uh, their knowledge base starts to build. Do we revisit the framework? Do we revisit the standards? What's our PD look like? That's what I want to know. Great. Any other burning questions? All right. So, so you know, this question came up earlier too, which is. You know, what are things that are not problems right now, but will inevitably be things in the three year, five year time frame, questions around, and some of you all mentioned this around, when does, you know, being a computer science teacher not require some other credential? What does, you know, uh, when do we have to re continue to revisit the underlying content, right? AI, data science, I mean, the field is continuously shifting. Sort of. Just for final thoughts, what are, what are some of the things that you're not spending a lot of time on, but you just feel like inevitably the, the folks will have to sort of confront in the years ahead? And I'll have anybody take it as your last comment. So I'll jump in quick. Uh, this is something the consortium is thinking about right now. And one of the reasons we've chosen to work with school districts is when you get an individual teacher who goes to an individual PD, that's a standalone instance in that sequence. And if you get every teacher in a school district to do that, we're gonna be teaching kids that this is an if statement for 12 years in a row. So how do we work with districts with our partnership members in the consortium to find coherent sequential pathways for teachers, students and teachers over those 12 years so that they hear, okay, this is an if statement, but by the time they make it to 11th and 12th grade, they get some more depth in that. And I think we do revisit the framework but the way that the framework was written, I'm looking at Brian, because he's gonna nod at me very vigorously. Uh, the way the framework was written was that as you get to the upper grades, you get more depth of thought, you get more higher order thinking in Bloom's taxonomy. So right now the framework is set up to be ready for that K through 12 sequence. And we have to help school districts not have the lone teacher who's going for the origination PD, but think about the more in-depth working group together to make those sequences for students. Yeah, so I think that um, those answers are correct. I think that the courses, both ECS and CS principles, rely heavily on project-based work. So as students show up more prepared, they do more interesting projects and deeper projects. And I think that, um, that this will grow well. I think the point that I'm worried about, which is maybe not for this audience, but uh, that we're, is not prepared is the college level, right? So we're gonna get, uh, hopefully, a much more diverse group of students showing up at college wanting to take computer science. Wanting not to be computer science majors maybe, but wanting to take lots of computer science. Wanting to use computer science in really sophisticated ways in their major, which may not be computer science. So students are going to be more diverse in terms of gender and ethnicity, but also in terms of their interests. 
and how do colleges respond to that by having multiple paths through their programs that can accommodate all these students. Um, and so that's down the road something I'm certainly worried about. Um, yeah, I'll, actually as a college professor, I'll, I'll sort of piggyback on that. Um, one of the things that we're, we're finding, and I think is, is fairly consistent, is that when the, when the enrollments were really low, when we were uh, in dire straits, um, all of our students were amazing. They were the core ones that had been doing computing all their lives, that had, that had the access. Um, it was very easy to teach those courses. Um, it's much more challenging now when there's a, a broad diversity of students, and that's a good thing. But it means that colleges have to adapt to this, that, that when we're getting students that have other plans, they're not all going to, to go work for Google, that they're going to, going to be using computing in other careers or, or uh, have different aspirations, that's our job to adjust to that. It's not their job to adjust to us. And I think that that, that is, uh, when we get high school and K through 12 all figured out, um, then I think we, uh, the colleges are, are sort of next in, in cleaning up our act. Hi, Cameron. Okay, quick. Um, this is one of the reasons why we built a pathway of courses was um, so that student experience, uh, originally we partnered with school districts around the U.S. before we shifted to having these local partners, um, this network of nonprofits. So and the districts would constantly tell us, I need a pathway. Like, what does it look like? So we built the full K-12 pathway. Now we don't have a complete pathway. We don't have every grade, but we have a lot of content that can be put in at uh, elementary, middle, and, and high school. And, I think I'm less worried about that in the short run. Um, I do agree with Leanne that at some point we need to start to think about revisiting the framework and then what does that mean back on the curriculum side is gonna be a big deal. Um, but I would hope that when that happens, there's a way deeper research base that is part of a community effort to figure out, I mean, there's research that went into the K-12 framework and they pulled a lot of what the best practices of research was, but I. We don't have a rich, robust research base right now in the community about appropriate learning concepts at certain grades. And it's just something that's developing, and so it needs to be a lot richer, and I think that will help feed into the K-12 framework revisions and then ultimately the CSTA standards as well. And I think all that research base can really help. Well, I want to really thank this amazing panel for all of their insight.